am going to miss that intro video. I'm going to miss it because of how profound it is. What God ignites, sets a flame, sets into motion, no one can extinguish or stop. We've been in this series, um, and we have been looking at various stories of individuals and moments in history where God has set a light of people. And like the Maori proverb that Michaela introduced at the beginning of the series that said, and I hope I'm saying this right, Kamura, Kamura Kamuri, we have been walking backwards into the future, remembering what God has done and praying that God will do it again, not only in our futures, but in our present realities in the here and now. And so we have walked backwards and looked at the story so far here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. We have looked at the lives and the ripple effects of Francis of Assisi, J.J. Doak, C.S. Lewis, and the legend that is Billy Graham. But tonight, we are going to walk backwards 50 years and look at the Jesus Movement. There it is, the Jesus movement of the late 60s and the early 70s. So before we do, let's pray. Oh God, your presence is so thick in here. Your presence is thick. And so God, I just pray that you would um, blow a fresh wind of your spirit in this place. And that you would pierce our hearts. And that we would be inspired as we look back that you, God, can do it again. Do it again. Raise up a Jesus movement in our midst. So have your way tonight, God. Have your way, have your way, have your way. And everybody said? Amen, amen. amen. So I, I, I was so digging this research. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in that 60s, 70s frame of mind. So here we go. In the summer of 1967, half a century ago this year, around 100,000 hippies and countercultural youth gathered in the um, Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco to drop acid, indulge in free love, and escape the establishment, and to escape the confines of their middle-class upbringings. Now, in the United States, it was a time of real political unrest. There was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the real threat of a nuclear war. There was the tragic assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and his brother, Senator Bobby Kennedy, and then Martin Luther King would be assassinated in 1968. There was segregation, marches, rioting, protesting in the streets, and young men were being drafted into the Vietnam War, and my dad was one of them. They came to San Francisco in droves, seeking something more, seeking something significant, something transcendent. But that summer of free love in 67, drugs and promiscuous sex wouldn't last. And disillusioned by bad um, LSD trips and drug overdoses and watching their friends die, thousands of burned out hippies soon experienced something even more revolutionary than turning out and turning on. They experienced a born again religious conversion. And like a tidal wave that spread right across the U.S. and then overseas, thousands upon thousands of hippies and youth became Jesus Christ followers, or Jesus freaks, as they were dubbed. It created such a stir that in 1971, it made the cover of Time magazine. Now, the epicenter of the Jesus movement, the hub where it was all happening, was in Southern California, Orange County, in the city of Santa Ana, Costa Mesa, where I was born and raised. Um, in a little non-denominational church of 25 called Calvary Chapel. The pastor of this little church was the man, was a guy called Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith was not only, not only, was not only known for his huge smile and his joy, he is known globally as the father of the Jesus movement. Now listen, contemporary music and uh, contemporary praise and worship began in the early um, 70s in this church, Calvary Chapel. Pastor Chuck was an incredible Bible teacher. His emphasis on Bible exposition, line by line, chapter by chapter, book by book, teaching the Bible from Genesis to Revelation every two years, not only changed a church, it changed a generation. 
and thousands of young adults went out around the United States and then around the world and started Calvary um, Chapel-style churches where there was a lot of worship and, and a casual feel. To date, there are 1,800 Calvary chapels across the United States, like there's, there's more than one in every state, with hundreds more overseas. And there are even Calvary chapels or affiliations of Calvary Chapel here in New Zealand. Its influence is in this room tonight. I became a Christian at Calvary Chapel and had the privilege of sitting under Pastor Chuck's teaching. The senior pastors, Craig and Michaela, when they were young Christians, used to crowd around a tape recorder and listen on cassette tape, which are little cassette tapes, to Pastor Chuck's teaching. And even Eric, um, our church care pastor, his dad worked closely with Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel back in the day. His influence, their influence, is global. Now, just a little bit about Chuck Smith, who I just absolutely love. Chuck Smith was born and raised in Southern California in a Christian home, and his mother taught him to read the Bible at four years of age. And he said that he, in his autobiography, he said that he loved to read about his biblical heroes, that they were more just than heroes to him, they were his friends. He trudged through the wilderness with Moses, fought the Philistines with Samson, but most of all, he ran with David. I love that. He married his wife, Kay, after six weeks of courtship. And everybody said it wouldn't last, but they were married for over 60 years, and they had four children. When Pastor Chuck first started out, he pastored and ministered in different churches for 17 years, 17 tough and rough years before he took on the struggling Calvary Chapel. And I say tough because you really have to love Jesus to be a pastor, especially in that day. When he started pastoring in those early churches, they only paid him, get this, $15 a week. And he had, and 45 of that had to go to rent. He had to get a second job so that his family could eat. So his family could eat. He said that during those extremely lean years, he learned to completely rely on God to provide. Now, Chuck started pastoring at Calvary Chapel in the late 60s, and stoned hippies and surfers were everywhere. Now, down the street from where Chuck and his family were living, there were a couple um, houses that sold drugs, and hippies would pass by all hours of the night to buy their dope. And Chuck said that back then he had a really bad attitude about it. He would just shake his head in disapproval. But then he would look over at his wife, Kay, and she would be weeping and praying for these kids. Her compassion for these troubled youth soon rubbed off on Chuck. Then their daughter started dating one. He was a new Christian, and he started inviting hippies over to their house to have Bible study and inviting them to Calvary Chapel. Hippies were getting baptized in Chuck's backyard in their plastic pool, and soon that congregation of 25 became 200. So they moved to another location and outgrew that quickly. And they found a piece of land, and Chuck then decided to purchase a gigantic circus tent. There you go, Colin. Golden Sands, Papa Moa, right there. There you go, Golden Sands. That thing was massive, absolutely massive. I remember as a little girl, as my mom would drive past in her Volkswagen Beetle, um, she we would see how big it really was, and she would always say, there goes that Jesus freak church. That tent could seat 2,000, but they had to erect another smaller tent to fit 400 more, but there was always an overflow. People were sprawled out everywhere. They had to have three services in the morning just to try to accommodate everyone. Hundreds of hippies and young people were gathering in the oceans, and getting baptized in the ocean at Corona del Mar, Huntington Beach, and Newport Beach. And at one stage, church, this is incredible, they were baptizing 500 kids a week. 500 kids a week. And one of those hippies that got saved and baptized at Calvary Chapel was a young guy called Greg Laurie. Some of you may have heard about him. Have a look at this clip from Greg Laurie and other pastors on how he remembered that time of the Jesus movement. And just a side note, Greg Laurie, who pastors a huge branch of Calvary Chapel um, called Harvest in Riverside, California, 
he was one of those hippies that used to walk by Chuck's house to buy his dope on the corner. Just so you know. We have Holly came to faith. of how I came to faith. And this little section you're going to see tells a story of uh, how I came to faith during the Jesus movement at Calvary Chapel. So check out the screens. Bye. Little country church on the edge of I was being exposed to a whole new world, and I, I went to this church that was overflowing with young people. It was always packed. They were outside. They were in chairs. It, it was like people were sitting in the aisles. Sitting up on the stage around Pastor Chuck. I don't know if there was any kind of fire marshal law back then. <laughs> I just remember when I stepped into the tent at Calvary Chapel, and I heard the music, and I heard the message. And it was a Bible message. It was clear cut. It was different because they spoke it in my language. Calvary Chapel was in the midst of a great revival, reaching out to the disillusioned young people who were searching for meaning, connecting them with Jesus and teaching them the Bible. The Jesus movement was spreading throughout California and across the United States. led by a balding middle-aged man named Chuck Smith. Chuck had a Bible in his hand and a love in his heart for searching restless young people. And God used him to reach thousands of kids for Christ. God raised up Chuck Smith. He changed his heart. He opened his heart up to kids like me. And he began to have a kind of a church where these young kids, these hippies could come. And, and, and that was really the heart of the Jesus movement. And it was just a few that began to come. But the, the message of Jesus Christ grabbed a hold of their souls. I remember the first time as I was sitting in church and Chuck Smith came out. And, you know, everyone up to this point was kind of young and cool and hip. So I thought, this is okay. I like this. You know, this is all of, it's still young people, you know, we're, we're, we have it all together. All of a sudden this adult comes up. Well, I, I didn't like adults. I didn't like teachers. I didn't like authority figures. Here he comes. Most of the kids in those days said, you never can trust anybody over 25. That's one of the glorious things that the Lord did is to uh, help me to cross that generation barrier that did exist and to communicate to young people. He sat in this little stool and he just opened up his Bible and I, I remember his smile. He just sort of beamed when he smiled and I thought, seems like a pretty happy guy for an old guy, you know? And, then he began to uh, teach the Bible, and what amazed me was I understood what he was saying. Jesus is Lord. He's working in a mighty way by his Spirit, and all you have to do is receive Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, and he will do the rest. It was logical. It made sense to me. It, it, it spoke to me where I was at, and I was learning things about God I'd never known before. So my attitude toward him changed immediately, and I thought, I actually like this guy. Here is a man and a woman that for 17 years, nothing has happened to them. They've had it tough. And then all of a sudden, at God's divine time, God begins to use Chuck and Kay, and it becomes a world movement. The Lord just chose for this time to pour out his spirit upon this troubled youth. And uh, many, many thousands came to know Christ during which was called the Jesus Movement by Life Magazine, I think. And uh, it was true, it's, it's Jesus was moving. God was doing something special in the Jesus Movement. And the Jesus Movement was bigger than Calvary Chapel, obviously. But God had such a unique role for Pastor Chuck and Calvary Chapel to play in that. What Pastor Chuck did was he brought these lives that were being changed and this outpouring of God that is often called the Jesus Movement and he really connected them to church. God has used him in an unparalleled way because he's stuck to the Word and he's taught the Word. I sometimes think if you squeeze Chuck, the Word of God would squirt out. He's a man who puts God first, and he is a, a role model. If a, if a young pastor's come along, you know, who, who do you want to shape your ministry after? Shape it after Chuck Smith, you won't go wrong. The American church was uncomfortable with these new young believers. They didn't fit with their long hair, 
beads and tie-dyed clothes. They just didn't look like Christians. I would be having sort of that negative attitude of, you know, we need to clean up this mess. And uh, I would turn over to my wife and she'd be weeping. And she'd be praying for these kids. And she said, honey, we've got to reach them. There were churches that didn't want those dirty people with the bare feet and the tie-dye shirts and the long hair. But bless his heart, Chuck Smith and, and, and his people welcomed them in, even changed the whole style of the church, accommodated their music, their guitars, their folk rock styles and all, and discipled them, and thus the Jesus movement came. Oh, there was a, a real uh, resistance on the part of organized religion to this Jesus movement, which, of course, made it even more appealing not only to kids that had not known church life, but even to kids who'd grown up in the church and were saying to their elders, hey, what's wrong? We thought you wanted kids to come to Jesus and they're coming to Jesus and, and you're turning them away because they got long hair and because they want to listen to rock music or, or maybe record rock music. The, the churches really weren't ready uh, to accept these kids. It was a complete cultural reorientation, sociologically, spiritually, it was That's as refreshing a thing, probably. <laughs> I thought I would show it. It had such a major century. effect on everything. And here's what I love about Pastor Chuck. He welcomed and accepted these hippies and young ones as is through those church doors. Now, there's a story I heard him tell once about a time when they had laid new carpet, and one of the elders put a sign on the front door of the church that said, no bare feet allowed. And Chuck went and tore down that sign, and he held a meeting with the elders, and he said, if because of the new carpet, kids are not allowed in because of their bare feet, then let's rip out the carpet and have bare floors. And if because of our new pews, they are not allowed to sit in them with their dirty jeans, then let's replace their pews and let them um, sit on boxes. But let's not keep these young people out because they need Jesus. That's the kind of heart Chuck Smith had. And many, many churches, and I heard story after story and read about it, that would not let the hippies through the door until they cut their hair or changed their clothes. Chuck not only allowed these hippies as is to come, he let them bring their art. He let them play their folk and rock music. And God would give these young musicians who were off the charts talented songs, and Pastor Chuck would let them play at the gatherings. He gave them a platform to share their music with one another. Chuck said that the music was so fresh, so real and raw that sometimes he felt like he was eavesdropping on their prayers with God. One of the music bands and, and a lot of the research that I did that kept being mentioned over and over and over that had a massive effect on people's um, faith was a band called The Love Song. Chuck Gerard was their lead singer and songwriter and they were the house band at Calvary Chapel. Now check out what Bill Hybels had to say about them. And uh, yeah, stay standing just for one more second. Uh, nobody impacted us more in the early days. You have to understand this too. There was not contemporary Christian music in the 60s and early 70s, and it had to be pioneered by somebody. Uh, so let me explain what it was. There was rock and roll secular music, and then, cut this out of the tape, very crappy Christian music. <laughs> you, is that all right? <laughs> but it was, I mean, so either, you know, it was one or the other, and uh, so then a, a guy by the name of Chuck Gerard shows up on the scene, and he has a group called Love Song. 1972, it came out. And it was music that had fantastic lyrics and some of it was kind of rock and roll, all different kinds of styles. And you have no idea what that did to this little group of young people and then eventually in the early days of Willow. You know how powerful music is. Some of you can remember like what you were listening to when you were dating your spouse or you know at your prom or different stuff. Music has those kind of memories associated with it. So let's fast forward 30 years from 1970. Now, the next clip that I'm going to show you is of love, a love song reunion show at Calvary Chapel. And Pastor Chuck is telling the story about the first time love song played for him. Battery, Chuck. 
They told me the battery was good. Back in 1970, uh, when we were over in the little chapel and the Lord was working, so many young people were coming out, uh, these hippies came in. <laughs> Long hair, beards. And uh, they said, um, we have a... <laughs> yeah, he basically said, can I help you? <laughs> And they said, we're musicians, and uh, we uh, got saved here just a short time ago, and the Lord's been giving us some uh, Christian songs, and we'd like to share them if we could here uh, for the, you know, the young people. And I looked at them, and I thought, <laughs> it was saved just a few weeks, and uh, so... I, I wanted to be, you know, sort of safe, and so I said, uh, could you um, play something for me? And so they went out to the old van, and uh, Volkswagen van, and they, uh, <laughs> they brought in their guitars and all, and uh, they started to play. And as they started to play, the spirit... The Spirit just touched my heart, and I said, tonight we've got, this is Monday night, we've got a uh, young people's gathering tonight, and uh, how about tonight? <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, well, one of our guys is doing weekends in jail for a marijuana rap. <laughs> Hey, not to point him out, they've all done it, you know. <laughs> they've all been arrested. And <laughs> but they said he gets off at noon, so we probably could play tonight. <laughs> so that was the beginning of uh, the music. But the song that they played that just really touched my heart was Welcome Back. I've got the song, Welcome Back. So you're going to see that. Instead of me just talking about it, I thought I would show you because there's so much great footage of this time. Now we're going to rewind to 1970. And um, Chuck Smith and Love Song are on the Catherine Kuhlman show. Now, Catherine Kuhlman, she was probably one of the first women TV evangelists when it kind of wasn't cool. She was really eccentric and dramatic, so bear with it. But she, and she had this healing ministry. And it isn't the best quality clip, but I'm so glad that there is actually early footage of these crazy, talented guys singing Welcome Back. Now, in this clip, Chuck Gerard is going to give a bit of his testimony um, of how he came to know Jesus. And it was so typical of so many in the day. So here is um, Love Song. No wonder we are a happy people, you know. Go ahead, Chuck. Well, I'd like to have you hear the testimony of one of our young men who actually is in the group called The Love Song, and God brought these boys to the Lord about a year and a half ago. Uh, well, my story is kind of typical, I guess, of a lot of young people nowadays. My search for God started on when I started taking drugs, and I got sort of caught up into the whole thing that was happening with the lyrics from the Beatles and... Just about the time I started taking drugs, Sergeant Pepper came out, and I was looking to all these, these men for answers and uh, trying to follow this path of the way hippies were going. You know, I sold all my possessions, and I went to Hawaii to live in a cave and to live off the land and stuff. And, uh, I, you know, after sitting over on the islands there for a while, which was kind of like a dream to me because, you know, it's so groovy over there and everything, and I had everything that I wanted. I had my guitar, and I had drugs, and I was searching for God. And I just realized that God really wasn't anywhere in the world, like I couldn't go to a place to find him. 
And uh, I found this vacuum in my heart that wasn't satisfied. And I realized that I wasn't doing any man any good sitting on a rock over in Hawaii. So I came back to the mainland and I just, I ran across, uh, I started hearing about the Bible and some of the scriptures in the Bible. And um, I heard the scripture that said, seek and you will find. And it impressed me as a promise that God was promising me if I looked hard enough that I would find him. So I just continued my search and I went through uh, a lot of different ways to try to find it. I went through the Eastern philosophies and some Buddhism and the Arantia book and Timothy Leary's trip and I went through all these things trying to connect them, you know, and I I never really heard how simple it was to just accept Jesus and that he was the answer, you know, because these other religions, philosophies kind of include him, but not as the son of God and the son of man. So I uh, decided, I'd heard about Calvary Chapel and I decided to give this place a try, you know, because I was being open-minded and I wanted to try everything that seemed like it might be a way. But it was the last place that I expected to find it, you know, because in my heart I felt it would be up on this mountain somewhere with this long-haired guru. And he said, well, in ten years we'll be on our way, you know. And that's how I really expected to find God. And I walked in and I heard Pastor Smith just laying down the simplicity of the gospel after I'd been making such a heavy thing out of it. For four or five years I was into LSD and drugs and marijuana. And I just heard, man, Jesus is died on the cross to save you because no man can make it because we're all just really rotten inside, you know. I'm coming to discover that more every day. <laughs> his grace and his love is just so abundant, and that's the answer to the world's problems, and there is no other answer. So being a musician, um, I wanted to dedicate my talent to the Lord, and um, the same with the fellows here in the group. So we all became Christians just about the same time out of the Laguna Beach dope scene, and uh, we found the Lord just about the same time. We decided that we would start giving our talents to him, and and the Lord started to give us tunes, and uh, we'd like to sing one and share one with you now called Welcome Back. It's one of the first songs we wrote, and it's kind of like a story that it's like God speaking to anyone that, that finally finds the truth and decides to yield his life to Jesus Christ.
were crazy talented. And here's the thing that's fascinating. These guys still tour today. They would play, they would play at all these different churches, put on full concerts, and listen to this. They would often only get paid $5 for their effort. They couldn't even afford to buy gas to get to their next gig. So they were just doing it for the love and to share the gospel. So Pastor Chuck started Maranatha Records. That's how it started so that these guys could at least sell some albums so they could pay for gas and food to get to the next gig. Other bands and singer-songwriters started to form at Calvary Chapel, and at one stage there were 17 bands, and the label just took off. Love Song, Children of the Day, Mustard Seed Faith, The Way, Larry Norman, Randy Stonehill. In the 1980s, um, when I was going through my Stevie Nicks phase, it was my first Wednesday night Bible study. I went to Calvary Chapel, and a guy called Daryl Mansfield um, was playing, and it blew my mind. Um, I was really into Van Halen as well, and he reminded me of David Lee Roth, but here's a little clip of Daryl Mansfield, and this is what he was playing when I first went to Bible study on a Wednesday night. I got a mansion, mansion in glory. Yeah. Whoa, and that's where I'm going to spend my time on my Talk about real fine gold. Guess what? Huh? I'll never be walking on a chilling, skipping on it all the time. Okay, and then, I know, it was just like, I was just like looking at everybody going, is this Bible study? I was like, no way, and then he would preach the amazing gospel, he had a great message, it was just like, oh my gosh, this is so incredible. And then I would go to Bible study, and they would have all these, I didn't even realize how famous they were, but they had, who remembers these guys, you have to be really old to remember this, but second chapter of Acts, Matthew Ward, crazy voice, crazy, check this out. I found video gold. That, that video, I found this three-hour thing where they, all these musicians, they called them all back to film and hear their stories of the Jesus movement. They rented a mountain retreat for three days, and they all played their music to each other. And you see them, and they're weeping, and Barry McGuire's crying like a baby, and they're all crying, just remembering how they felt then, and, and their call to Jesus, and they all played for each other, man. And I was bawling, too, and it was way before my time. So I just thought, man, this is absolutely incredible, but the spirit just fell. And then there was my favorite, Phil Keggy, and he used to play at Calvary Chapel, and he also played with Love Song um, as well. There's a story floating around, a legendary story that... Um, someone asked Jimi Hendrix, what's it like to be the best guitar player in the world? And he said, I don't know. Ask Phil Keggy. Bill Kagey's still touring as well. It's absolutely incredible. And then there was the legendary Keith Green, who died in a plane crash along with two of his children in 1982. He was 28. He was 28. He had such an impact on the Christian music scene. Here's a little clip of Keith Green. Like waking up from the longest dream. How Tell you love broke through. I have been lost 
Some of you could even finish that song. Yeah. In 1972, Billy Graham and Campus Crusade held a music festival called Explo 72, held in Dallas, Texas, and 200,000 young people and hippies showed up. Incredible. It made history. I have to say, I love what Pastor Chuck had to say when Catherine Kuhlman on her, on her show, asked him to talk about the start of this Jesus movement. Tell me about it, Chuck. Tell me about the start of the Jesus movement. And he immediately, he doesn't hesitate, he answered, the Jesus movement started 2,000 years ago. I'm not doing anything new. God has always been moving. I am just blessed to ride the wave. You see, who would have thought when God decided to make his move that he would show up on the hillsides of a forgotten part of the world called Galilee and use 12 bearded young guys? And who would have thought that when a fresh move of God's spirit showed up in America, that he would bypass denominational churches and cathedrals and religious institutions and the seminaries and go and find a bunch of hippies sit down in their midst and do a life-changing work. You see, our premise for this whole series is that as we have looked back at what God has done in the lives of just ordinary people who God used in mighty ways, my prayer and our prayer as a church is that our children and that our children's children and our young people, that God will raise up another Jesus generation And young people, I pray that when you are middle-aged, and let me tell you, it comes by in like a New York minute. It comes by so fast. And as you walk backwards into your futures, that your mind will be blown and that you will never recover at all that God has done in your life. You don't want to miss it. Grab hold at what God is doing. Amen? If I could have the band come out. I think it's fitting to have some closing words um, from Pastor Chuck Smith himself. God has a plan for each generation, what he wants to do and how to reach each generation. And I think the important thing is to just be open to the leading of the Spirit and to find out how God wants to move and then move with God it's important to pray, Lord, what is your program? Find the moving of the Spirit and then move with the Spirit rather than trying to get the Spirit to move in the channel that you've created. God still wants to create a strong fellowship of believers, that koinonia. He also wants us to observe uh, the ordinances and of course he wants us above all to pray. And when we do these things, God will bless it. And one of these days, should the Lord tarry, you no doubt will pick up your paper and read, Chuck Smith died last night. Pastor of Calvary Chapel, etc., etc., etc. Don't believe it. That's poor reporting. If they're going to tell the truth, they're going to have to say, Chuck Smith moved last night (laughs) out of a decrepit old holy tent 
leaky tent into a beautiful new mansion. Hey, you don't need to weep for me because I've moved out of the tent into the house, the building of God not made with hands, you see.